Stevenson was born October 13th and is in NICU. Jackie Brotherton's grandson Jeffrey uh, will see a neurologist. Craig Balch is undergoing outpatient therapy after a stroke, and uh, Jamie told us Sunday how good he is doing. Back to doctor, she said the doctor had bragged on how well he had come along, and so they were really hopeful for his situation. Uh, recovering from surgery procedure, uh, Desi Lennon, Jackie Brotherton, and Eva Smear. Undergoing chemotherapy radiation is Kelly uh, Pesednik's friend, Ms. Atkinson, and Clara Dot's sister-in-law, Carol Bettis. I continue to remember, uh, we have quite a list there, different ones that we need to <clears throat> keep in mind. Uh, we have a sympathy extended here, Bill Werner, who was a member here at Bridgewood for a long, long time, I understand. Uh, he's a former member and thought leader. He passed away Thursday, October 27th. Uh, visitation is going to be Saturday, November 5th, from 1 to 2 at Grove Hill Funeral Hall, 3920 Samuel Boulevard in Dallas. Funeral service will also be the same day, November 5th, at 2 p.m. at Grove Hill Funeral Hall. Our sympathy goes out to this family. Coming up today, we're having a ladies quilting, and we have lots of room in here. We can add anybody that wants to be part of us. We'd love for you to come be with us. Um, don't forget, uh, it says don't forget the, the uh, sack lunch, but if you've forgotten it by now, <laughs> you well, you can just fill up on donuts. Yeah, that's right. We have this gracious lady that brings us like a, a surprise to bring these donuts in. Um, day not saving uh, ends Sunday, November 6th at 2, 2 a.m. And we know we, we go back on that. We fall back. The man on the radio, the car radio this morning, we're going, he said, we're going forward. I thought, oh, that's going to hurt some people. Yeah. Uh, but we know that it's fall back and spring forward. Okay, uh, Sunday night for the Masters is going to be November 6th at 6.30 p.m. <laughs> Are you laughing at us, Pam? Uh, <laughs> I said we're going to lose an hour, and she says, no, we're going to gain an hour. <laughs> when we fall back. Did yeah. we lose it? No. 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 <laughs> we'll discuss it in quick. 
helping. Okay. <laughs> explain it to me. <laughs> Next week is ladies' luncheon, so we want to remember now about that. Um, I didn't write down anything. We're talking about doing a little bit different, so so it'll be simpler. And go ahead and make the announcement. Okay, we're going to have a simpler luncheon that day, and that we're going to have salads. And are we going to say dessert too? Yes. Okay. Unless the lady brings donuts. Yeah. Are <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you can put those in the freezer? <laughs> okay. Just I bring your favorite uh, salad. I just put up there so they could put what they're bringing, so we don't. Okay. Have all There's the a sign. I mean, yeah. a yeah. sheet back there too for you. And to look usually, at. And usually we only have about twelve, so we don't need. Um, salad and 14. Not whatever. Thing like um, desserts. So, yeah. okay. If you see where desserts are getting too big, okay. Salad in there. Okay. Um, does anyone else have something they want to say? I know yeah. Sarah does. But does anyone else have someone you want to talk to us about? Okay. Uh, I'm going to be saying the prayer this morning. I do want to do your announcement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I've got two quickie announcements. Uh, Hollyville Church is having a uh, lectureship, it says fifth annual lectures, Friday night at seven, and then a lesson at eight. Uh, and it's uh, entitled Christianity and Productive Life. And uh, uh, let's see, I, I met with some of these speakers. Uh, Saturday, it starts at 1 p.m. and goes through uh, 2, 3, and then 7. And uh, then Sunday, they're having a lunch. Oh, okay. And uh, 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 let's say Tom Waycaster, many of you know, is speaking Sunday at 10. Of course, that would uh, mean that we couldn't be here, but what we might do anyway, aren't, aren't these going to be uh, recorded or live streamed? Do you know if these will be live streamed? Probably. Probably. So it would be good if you uh, wanted to. Uh, I know Trent Kennedy, but I've never heard him specifically. I, we met him in uh, Paraguay. And um, uh, Mel Hutzler, oh yeah, I know Mel really well. Uh, he uh, preaches for the uh, Northern Oaks Church in San Antonio. And um, it, it was kind of funny, he came up here to go to the uh, Brown Trail School of Preaching, spent the night with us. He and another student, uh, and the other one was Rob Whitaker, who does a lot of uh, uh, personal evangelism uh, workshops. And anyway, they uh, really kind of wanted to come here, but the Southwest School in Austin was closer to home. And uh, so, uh, uh, and Mel grew up in the Catholic Church, and uh, Rob taught him and uh, baptized him, and when he was baptized, his father wouldn't let him come home. So Mel lived with Rob for uh, quite some time. You know, so these things happen. These things happen. Uh, but he, he is uh, a really, a really good guy. And of course, John Hafner, you know him. Uh, but I think you'll you'll be encouraged by either going if you can, or if these are live stream, uh, live streaming. Because we, uh, there are things like the harvest is plentiful, the power of transformation, uh, beginning to grow, and uh, the power of wisdom, and things like this that I think would be helpful to all of us. And then I want to uh, mention one other thing. Um, I just mentioned this to Ruby, and she thought it was a good idea. And I think you'll think it's a good idea, too. Uh, but Julie Williams had been so good to come and fill in for Jean. Uh, of course, 
how do you fill in for Jean? <laughs> but but she she had done a, a really good job at that. And also, you know, she was here pretty much all last year, and uh, that has been really helpful to Julie, and uh, and it's been really helpful to us too. And they're moving to Crescent. They've just uh, built a new house, and uh, that's going to be good so that Julie gets to make her home. And uh, uh, they're having an open house on November 12th. Of course, we're going to be out of town, and there's also the Louisville, no, not Louisville, the Wiley Ladies Day on uh, November 12th. Uh, but it's in the afternoon. If you wanted to go, uh, that would be neat. They're even going to have food, <laughs> as if we needed it. But I thought it would be kind of a neat idea if, uh, if we maybe put together some things uh, like Oh, just maybe some clean house cleaners, some napkins, or some uh, maybe canned goods, or, or something, or, or and not you know don't spend a fortune on it. Just one or two little things from each of us, and we'll put them in a. I've got a big basket, and uh, I'll tell you. I'll go ahead and tell you this. Clayda was real sweet to make her one of the bags with butterflies on it, and. Uh, I had asked her to and told her I'd pay her and she wouldn't let me. But anyway, uh, she, you know, we, she, we've shown her her love in that, uh, our love in that way. And I picked up one of Janie's cool little lap quilts when she brought some of them here that I thought Jim would enjoy this winter uh, because he's going to be living with them. And this congregation, you, you may not realize it, but you had really helped that whole family just uh, when they would come off and on on uh, Sunday night, really showing them love and that they were a part of the family. Uh, you don't necessarily have to place membership to be a part of the family of God. And it's really, really helped them. So I thought if you wanted to just show a little thank you and love to Julie, uh, over the next, what, couple of weeks, Gary and I can take it down there sometime. Uh, we've been telling them we were going to come down and see their house, and we just haven't gotten down there. But we can take it down there sometime. What um, time is, is it in the afternoon? Yes, it's in the afternoon. I, she sent me a text. I'll look it up in a little bit and, and see. Uh, but it is in, in kind of the late afternoon, I think. Uh, but uh, it, it would be, you know, kind of special to do something and and if you know if someone could actually go that day if we had it all together it'd be kind of neat to take it that day but you know it doesn't really uh, matter on that I don't think but anyway that's it and do you have a friend and Jean has the song yes okay. <laughs> and I hope somebody knows it <laughs> Oh. 
Don't be afraid, I'm not going to leave it far. I wouldn't dare. Um, but I do have one I want to refer to in just a little while. Uh, I hope we have time to get to uh, most of what I have. I was thinking, uh, it seems like I prepare a lesson and prepare a lesson and, and uh, then somebody says something, and I, like Mary said last week, and then I start thinking and thinking and thinking again. And I do have this lesson coming up uh, on the uh, uh, when it's on the 12th in Mount Pleasant, 
that deals with uh, those who stood beside the cross, and I deal with that uh, a little differently from uh, what uh, you hear most of the time. And so I've been having a whole lot of things on my mind about Jesus. And why didn't people understand Jesus? And, and Mary mentioned that the uh, last, because we talked about the situation where the man was let, let down, you know, in the midst. And uh, Jesus, first of all, said, your sins are forgiven you. And then as they, the leaders reasoned among themselves, they said, uh, who can forgive sins but God? And then Jesus asked them, why do you reason this evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk, but that you may know that the, and he says the Son of Man has uh, power on earth to forgive sins, and he said, rise and walk, and the man did. Uh, and Mary was saying, why didn't they see that? And, and I, I think that sometimes myself. Why didn't they see that? But as we mentioned, what, they saw a man. And, and uh, uh, she mentioned uh, what one writer, one of the gospel writers said, that they were astonished that God had given such power to men. But that's who they saw. They saw a man. And it's hard for us even to to think in terms of the infinite Godhead, the infinite God as man. And I, uh, I began thinking about that, and then I, I and uh, we'll try to get to the infinite man today. If we don't, we'll get to it next week. Uh, because learning about Jesus and learning more about Jesus is what's really important. Uh, and we never learn enough about Jesus. And, uh, most of y'all, well, y'all yeah, know, I grew up in the church, and I grew up with a, a grandfather that was always showing me in the Bible how the, Jesus was always there, and so on. Uh, but I also grew up going to every gospel meeting within driving distance. And at that time, we had gospel meetings. Sometimes they were two weeks long. <laughs> Sometimes they were one week. And most of the time they were outside because we didn't have air conditioning. And uh, they would be outside. So some people heard the gospel that didn't want to, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, I remembered a lot of that preaching. And then later on when Peyton was, it was just right after he was born. So it's something like 46 years ago. He's 47 which means I'm 77, okay, I was I turned 30 a week after he uh, was born. But at any rate, uh, uh, Gary and I went to a workshop in West Monroe, Louisiana, and Jim Woodruff was speaking at that time. And he was talking about the fact, and, and it's overstatement, but I'm going to tell you what he was saying. He was saying that basically we let Billy Graham preach the gospel the good news about Jesus and what he's done for us, and we came in behind and straightened people out on how to respond to the gospel. Now that's an overstatement in regard to our preaching, but it hit me kind of because I got to thinking, yeah, a lot of the time the preaching that we did in gospel meetings was more about how to become a Christian than it was about what Jesus had done for us. Now, and again, remember that he's speaking in overstatement, just like some say that we never did know anything about grace, you know, we didn't preach anything about grace. Well, Brother Tedley wrote the song about grace in 1938, you know. Uh, so I think Brother Tedley knew uh, the grace, and I can't think of the name of the song right now, but it was, uh, oh yeah. The, uh, Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immeasurable grace I see, you know, uh, in his suffering at Calvary. So I think our older preachers understood grace. But again, what were we trying to do? Help people see that, that it's not just grace alone, it's not just faith alone. And I, I think back over uh, a lot of that. But anyway, 
even though Jim Woodruff's statement was overstatement, it hit me as, I wonder how much of, about Jesus I really know. And so I came home from that and I started reading Matthew and then John, Mark and then John, Luke and then John. And why was I reading John more often? John explains Jesus to us. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us the events, but John explains Jesus to us. And then I started listening to every lesson that I could find, and it was on little cassettes, but every lesson that I could find that was dealing with Jesus. But I did remember one outstanding sermon that I heard at a gospel meeting in Dodge City, Texas. Y'all can look that up. It's uh, it's right down from Wyndham. It's now on Highway 56. It used to be Highway 82, but they put 82 through north of there. But anyway, I remember when I was a young teenager, very young teenager, they had just gotten the water coolers in the building, so this gospel meeting was inside the building. And I remember where I was sitting, and Johnny Jackson from Dallas was preaching that night, and he was preaching uh, on uh, from Isaiah 53 about the death of Jesus. And I was just, you know, I, I thought, I, I, it was just so beautiful. It, it was just so fantastic. And so after that, uh, let's see, it was long in the 70s, early 70s, we were in Idaho, and uh, and that's a little big place outside of Lubbock. And uh, at the ACU lectureship, I saw the program, and it said Johnny Jackson on uh, the uh, cross of Christ or something like that. And I told Gary, I said, that one lesson will be worth the whole trip. It was. If I hadn't heard anything else, hearing that lesson again was and that started me again looking at Jesus and and it's it's a and a, what Mary was bringing out it, it's so awe-inspiring really that God would become man that God would care enough about our situation to become man and I had pulled out the song and I'd sung this all my life, but I was thinking of this song as I was driving to today, more about Jesus. If you want to look at it, I'm not going to read all of it, but uh, it's number 415. More about Jesus, what I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, show him the things of Christ to me. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory, all his own. More of his kingdom, sure increase. More of his coming, prince of peace. And that's the way I felt when uh, I was thinking about what we would do for our study. I wanted to go back and see more about Jesus. And I'm going to see how much time I've got. I think maybe we can get through most of this. Uh, John, when John records miracles, uh, John records them usually with uh, a sermon or lesson afterward. Uh, and this one is in particular one. And there was something, uh, oh, and I've got it marked here in my Bible. I must have seen this before I, I was studying from another copy of the, my, the New Testament that I had beside my computer. I must have actually seen this before, and I didn't, and I thought it was a new thought now. Uh, but this one, uh, you remember, was by the pool of the Seda, where uh, the, uh, uh, and this is John chapter 5, and I think we just begin in, uh, yeah. And it also happened at a uh, uh, feast of the Jews. And with so many people being there that Jesus could slip into the crowd, 
uh, and with John mentioning it, he doesn't mention, and if you want to know what page we're on here, it's the 6-4, lesson 6-4. Uh, and in uh, John chapter 5. I see some of you looking and wondering where we are. <laughs> so, uh, but um, the, uh, this was probably the Passover, probably the Passover, because John mentions uh, the Passover feast and sometimes just calls it the feast. And there were a lot of sick people, lame people, lying around this pool uh, because it, the idea was or the, uh, uh, that a, uh, an angel came down, down and troubled the water. That's, uh, and some people say, oh, that was just a folk tale. It may have been, or it may have been true. Can't God work in ways that we don't always understand? But we also know that there are, even today, healing waters. Uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas, and you know, uh, people would go there, and the warm mineral water was soothing to them and helpful. Uh, I think Gary mentioned that uh, uh, President Roosevelt went to FDR, went to some place in Georgia, I believe, where there were uh, mineral waters and mineral wells, uh, just right down here. Uh, and so many times, uh, with certain ailments, you know, doctors tell you that, oh, in fact, you don't have to be in an ailment. It isn't a nice jacuzzi uh, healing in some ways. But at any rate, uh, it says whoever was first into the water was healed. And there was a certain man who had had this infirmity for 38 years. In infirmity. For 38 years, and it doesn't mean that he was lying there for 38 years, but he had had this uh, disease or infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Oh, yes. And I... Uh, so he answered, I don't have anyone to put me in the pool when the water's stirred. And uh, while I'm coming, uh, another steps down before me. So I, I can't get there. I can't get to the healing waters. I, I've been trying, but I can't get there. And I just thought of that, too. Huh. I've been trying. You know, in our lives sometimes, are we trying to do something and we can't get there? But Jesus comes into our lives and what? I've been trying to be uh, patient, but I can't get there. But if I look to Jesus, what about it? Can I get there? Uh, I've been trying to be uh, at peace, but with Jesus in our lives, can we have peace? Just that just flew into my head right there. Okay, but Jesus tells him, rise, take up your bed, and walk, and immediately, immediately he was made well, he took up his bed and walked, and it was the Sabbath day. Oh. Ah, and the Jews, and anytime John uses the Jews, he's talking about the leaders of the Jews, uh, the rulers of Sanhedrin and us uh, said to him, it's a Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Does that sound like some of us sometimes? Ah. Uh, now, I'm afraid it sounds like me sometimes. And he answered him and said, well, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. And then they ask him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now notice they didn't say, who is the man who said, who healed you? They don't want to acknowledge the healing. So they say, who told you to take up your bed? Who told you to violate the Sabbath? Not who uh, healed you. Who healed you. And... Um, 
Let's see, where am I on this? Yeah. I have one or two other things written down here. Okay, so the uh, one who was healed didn't know it was Jesus. He just knew somebody did it, and Jesus had been able to very quickly get into the crowd. And you might say, well, the man had to stoop down and roll up his bed, didn't he? And have you just turned your back a little bit and a, a child <laughs> ran away or something? If there's a big crowd, Jesus could just slip into the crowd and uh, the man wouldn't know for sure who it was. Uh, or Jesus had withdrawn since there was a multitude in that place. And that's another reason that most people believe this was on the Passover because there were so many more people uh, there than in most of the other feasts, especially the lesser feasts. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Stop and think about that. Apparently, this man's infirmity was caused by some sin in his life. Now, it's not true that every time there's an infirmity that it's because you sinned. We talked about that, I think, last time. Like with Job, you know, his friends wanted to, him to, uh, to admit that he had sinned because he was suffering. Uh, but Jesus knew this man, didn't he? He knew his past history. Jesus knows. And so he could say to him, sin no more. Oh. And aren't there some infirmities that are caused by our own sin? People that have cirrhosis of the liver because they have been alcoholics forever and ever. Can they be saved? Yes. Can they continue to drink? No. But do they still have cirrhosis of the liver? And but what's the worst thing? If a person like that, and I believe that, yeah, it was, and Phyllis wouldn't mind me saying this, but her husband had cirrhosis of the liver. And he also had smoked a lot, and so he had uh, some lung problems, too. And he used to talk to young people about, don't do this, because you'll have all of these things. Don't do this. So, but what's a worse thing than living with cirrhosis of the liver? Mm -hmm. Sin no more. Yeah. You're being lost. Yeah, yeah, being lost. You're eternal. And that's why Jesus said, sin no more. Change your life, lest the worst thing, uh, lest being lost comes upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews it was Jesus who had made him well. Is that a bad thing that he did? See, he didn't know what the Jews, what the leaders were wanting. You know, he didn't know their uh, thinking about Jesus. So he just goes and tells them, hey, it was this guy. You know, yeah. I probably would have done the same thing, you know, uh, to tell them. And then, and here is where uh, John gives us more information about the response. Now, here, this man, don't you think he's pretty excited about being made well? Uh -huh. For 38 years. Yeah, that's on. Well, no, I started to say that's almost a lifetime, but not quite, but, but it's a long time to be living with that. And then uh, he didn't know that the Jews, it says, persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. Persecuted Jesus. Why? Because he broke one of their little rules. He did things on the Sabbath day. He did good things on the Sabbath day. And we'll see that over and over through, through here on several of these miracles. Do you think he was working miracles on the Sabbath day to teach a lesson? Mm -hmm. 
and to draw out the people. Mary, you look like you want to say something. Well, I was just thinking, today it's baptism. That's a work. Yeah. You know, we're, we're saved by grace. We don't need the work. Yeah. And <laughs> how much work is baptism? Yes. Yeah, yes. I, I, well, in fact, in Colossians chapter 2, I think uh, we say that baptism is a work, <laughs> but it's a work of God. It's a work of God, not of me. And uh, I have an aunt that's uh, Baptist. And she's the sweetest person on the face of the earth. Uh, but, and she was at a lady's side that I was speaking at, and in the Philippians, Colossians, here we are. And I just made this point, uh, because I was speaking from Colossians anyway, so that was good. But, um, let us see, it's in Colossians 2, and uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, it's Colossians 2, uh, verses 11 and 12, where Paul says, In him, that is in Christ, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. That's when you put off the body of sins of the flesh. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him, through faith in the what? The working of God. So yeah, baptism is a work, but it's God's work. And that was the point I, I made uh, that day. Uh, it's, uh, we have faith in God's work who raised Jesus from the dead. And uh, I don't know that it did any good, but at least uh, I tried. Oh, but, but yeah, people put, you know, uh, don't want to see sometimes. Is that it? I'm, I'm trying to think. Why. The, the leaders of the Jews wanted it to be their way. And also, also, there was a, there was a sense of power there. A sense of power. They defined to the people what the law was. And here Jesus comes along and he says, you've messed up the law, you know, by your traditions. And he proves that he has the right to say that by these miracles. But they don't like that because of, and I, and someone told me, I, I think it was Judy Bowes mentioned this, but I had heard this years and years ago. Uh, and Gary told me he thought Johnny Ramsey actually knew for sure if this was true. But I heard this years ago in uh, gospel meetings that one of our uh, brethren had contacted Billy Graham about the response to the gospel. And that Billy Graham had said, oh yes, but if I preached that, I would lose my father. And his wife, I think they, he yeah. also said he, yeah. he, he, his wife was, he couldn't object to it because of his wife. Oh, okay, and Gene Simpson just said that he also said he couldn't object to it because of his wife. Does some people like that too? But, but look at that, a man who knew And, and said, I would lose my position. And you know, he, he had such ability, didn't he, as a speaker. But I would lose my position if I taught really what the Bible said. And Judy Bowes, I think, was saying that when she would go to some of these book selling places, that some of those, the Baptist people would say, well, Billy Graham, just won't preach that, you know, they would they would verify that. So they're saying he won't preach the whole truth. But that's the way these rulers of the Jews were. They would lose their position. They would lose their following. 
And, and that's scary even among us. We don't have to go out here somewhere else. Uh, and of course, Max Arcado has gone so far away, I, I can't really say that he's us anymore. But he, he won't say all the truth because he'd lose his following. And he has a, a program on TV, I think it's on Channel 58, and off and on when he has gone, I'll watch some odd men, things like that. And I caught him one time, and he was talking about grace. And he was talking about the situation in John 8, and I know we're going off this lesson, but that's okay. We have time. We can pick it up next week, too. But he was going off uh, onto that. Uh, in John 8, where the woman was brought to him who was in, uh, taken in adultery in the very act. Uh, of course, as someone said, if she's in the very act, there was also a man who was in the very act, but they bring the woman. And he made a really good point that Jesus was, he was, I think at the first he was sitting, teaching, and they bring her in the midst. And when they confront him, he stoops down, so he was sitting, then he stoops down and writes in the, in the ground. And then when everyone leaves, he stands up, you know, and he said, neither do I condemn thee. But he ends it right there. He doesn't say that he said to her, go and do what? Sin no more. And I just thought about that. I thought, that's, that's saying, well, Jesus doesn't condemn adultery. Because he didn't finish the, the thing. And uh, Jean, I think you were, yeah, yeah, the trip that we were on in, uh, uh, up to South Dakota, and when we came back, the tape that was played the Sunday that we came back, uh, it was a lesson on joy uh, from Rick Ashley. And uh, Rick Ashley talks about joy and the joy of being in Christ and the joy of uh, salvation and all like this, you know. But he's over here and asks, I believe it was Acts 16, I believe that's where he was. Uh, no, wait. I think it was 16. Uh, oh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. In Acts 16, and he, he was talking about Paul and Silas there, you know, in the uh, the jailer saying, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's in verse 30. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your household. And then he skips down and says, and uh, then he skips down and says, and he rejoiced having believed in God with his whole household. He skips over all the things about baptism. You know, just jump right over it. And that sounds good to people out here like Mary was talking about, doesn't it? Sounds good to And Gary was fuming. And I, I think he and two or three others on the trip uh, said something uh, about that, that that was a bad choice of a lesson because there were some people on there who were not members of the church. You know. So we need to be careful that we're not just pulling out what we want. We need to be careful that we're not being like the, uh, the rulers of the Jews here. And it's sometimes those, sometimes those who become popular speakers have that temptation a lot of times. And I, I heard of one one time over at uh, College Hill. I think I was the only one from here that went there uh, to that. And 
it, it was a comedy hour. Uh, one scripture referred to, and the first lesson was basically just comedy hour, and the second lesson was uh, was a more quoting from people like uh, Desmond Tutu, who is an Anglican uh, leader in South Africa, uh, quoting from Max Licato, quoting from a lady who is, uh, I think she's also an Anglican writer, and, and even quoting from Dr. Wayne Dyer, and a lot of people didn't know uh, who Sorry. he was. And uh, at any rate, there's all this quoting of all this, and none from the Word. None from the Word. Well, there was one scripture. Yeah, one lesson. But I was a huge him. He just walked through. Yeah. Okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, but I was just concerned. Somebody might see that on the, you know, God's sent for a woman to teach over a man. Uh, he speaks in our air condition. Yes, he speaks in our air condition. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I was so concerned about that. And there were people sitting there older than I was, just enjoying the thing, you know? Just, and I was like, what's going on here? And, uh, and, and you know, College Hill is, a, is not a way out there place. You know, and uh, I this is back when Bob was still an elder, and I I came to Bob and told him I said this this bothered me a whole lot, and I said but I don't want to cause problems, <laughs> you know. And I asked him if it was okay if I wrote this lady, and and he said yes, and I said okay, will you? read my letter before I send it. Because Jean knows sometimes if I'm really concerned about something, I can go, woo, over here. <laughs> and so he agreed to. And I sent her the letter. And she answered back, telling me how many Bible studies she had going on in prison with women and how much other stuff that she did. And that she was a teacher like Jesus, a storyteller. <laughs> well, you're a storyteller, but not like Jesus. Uh, and I started to answer that one. And then I thought, no, Sarah, just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Because, you know, she had rationalized that everything she was doing was okay. Everything she was doing was okay. And some people really liked it, you know. I, I talked to a friend of mine who was who's really uh, uh, solid in the Word, and, and in fact, she uh, used to attend at College Hill, but now they live down in San Antonio. Uh, and I, I talked to her about it. I said, this just really bothered me. And she said, well, you know, Sarah, I think women get so much Bible in their uh, sermons and all like that and in their uh, uh, classes on Sunday morning that they get so much Bible that they want to be entertained at ladies' day. Well, some might, but I don't want to waste my time on that. You know? Amen. I want to hear the word when I go to a ladies' day. That's why Lori Boyd did a good job with the word uh, on that ladies' day. And I'm hoping that uh, the same thing will be true with Becky Blackman on the ladies' day in Wiley. Um, and guess what they're going to hear in Mount Pleasant? I'm going to entertain them. I'm not good. But uh, well, we got a little bit off the track, but not really. There is a lesson here, isn't there? There's a lesson from this of the way the leaders of the Jews, and then we need to be careful. Instead of just pointing a finger and saying, look what the leaders of the Jews did, we need to look at ourselves and say, uh, could we be doing a similar thing? And sometimes, some of the things, in fact, uh, we probably next time we'll, we'll finish this up and we may do the man with the withered hand too. It's just interesting to read over 
uh, the uh, research that this individual has done about the way that the, uh, the carrying of the burden, for instance, uh, and that probably would have been good to have been over here in this other lesson, but uh, the way the Jews had classified, they had developed 39 classifications of work and divided and subdivided each of the classifications. Wouldn't you like to be led by people like that? <coughs> but do we have some brethren sometimes who do that? I know uh, one or two. And it bothers me because I keep thinking there are some things that are much more important than whether a woman wears a pair of slacks or a dress to worship. And there's some things more important than whether a man wears a suit and tie to church or, you know. And I'm not saying that we ought to be sloppy about things, but we tithe mint and anise and cumin and omit the weightier matters of the law sometimes. And I probably said too much. <laughs> Jane, did you have? <clears throat>